forward to that. But tonight we are talking about uh, the Republic of Venice. I put in the first time, I mean, originally we called it Republic of Venice. I stuck that subtitle, A History, because I, I was trying to think of how we're, how we're going to organize this thing. Um, it is kind of, we're going to do history, but we're also um, going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of its constitutional background and how its system operated. So Venice has an interesting and unique history as a republic. And so we're going to talk a lot about how, how that came to be and how that worked. Oh, and so I mentioned I have my, my pictures from Venice to show you. <laughs> and so it was beautiful. I mean, we were just, we were amazed by it because even though I had never been. So I had read um, several books of history on Venice, but hadn't had been. And we, of course, know that Venice is like the um, original tourist trap. <laughs> so really, in the, in the 18th century, when 17th and 18th century, when people started being tourists, Venice is like the first place um, they started going to. And they are still all there. There's a Donald Duck on there? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, oh yeah, there. So yeah, well, they do have a McDonald's in Venice now. <laughs> so yes, you'd imagine. So, <laughs> But anyway, so we went around and there's just, this is, every corner is like this. But one of the more um, interesting things that we were thinking about is the, the extent to which um, it is still nevertheless like a modern uh, city that is almost like living in, a, in an alternate timeline because uh, it is primarily the canals are the way you can actually get around with anything in bulk. And so, for example, when you hear all the police cars going, rrr, rrr, th th those are boats. <laughs> and the same thing that we went to the fire, went to fi past the fire station. The fire station is a big port thing that, you know, like where the boats come out, you know, because all the boats, and, and then every morning there's all the garbage truck boats, it's boats, right? <laughs> and that are all, and so, and everything like that, like the, the DHL guys on the <laughs> boats, you know, and everything like that. So the boats are, uh, it, it's, it's interesting how that's all, and this is static, but when you just even see how all the things are all moving around against it, it's really kind of an amazing um, different way to have a, um, anyway, city in the 21st century. It's called the Grand Canal? Yep, Grand Canal. So yeah, that's the, you know, map of how it is now, and so uh, there's the Grand Canal that goes all the way through, winds all the way through, but then all the way through there's all these other little canals everywhere, and uh, St. Mark's famous is the famous square where the Doge's Palace uh, and the Basilica of St. Mark's is, and it was, anyway, and you could just wander all around through all these little corridors, which we, we tended to do. The tourists do congregate, and they, they fill the whole plaza, and they, they get off at these giant, you know, there's all these cruise ships here that just dump people, you know, or continuously. Uh, but you can, depending on how you do it, we, we got up at, um, at dawn and went over to St. Mark's, and there was nobody there except for all the street cleaners, which was also kind of neat, and there was also sunrise, and it was really quite beautiful, and so we got to experience it that way. So anyway, we had a really wonderful trip. <laughs> so it's not about the, my trip. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> this is a um, really modern uh, drawing of Venice, and it was one of the first um, cities to be, it's so distinctive, and it is one of the first cities um, that people actually mapped in a kind of a realistic way. And so there's lots of early depictions of Venice, um, probably in part because you need a map to get around, <laughs> you know, and so on the one hand, it's very easy to, to get turned around in Venice, but on the other hand, uh, because it's so distinctive and also because it was so wealthy. And so um, by the end of the Middle Ages, uh, Venice, which doesn't seem that big now uh, to us because of how vast cities have gotten, um, may have been the second largest city in Western Europe uh, in population, so after Paris. Paris would have been bigger, uh, but number one in wealth because of how amazingly wealthy uh, the Venetians were. Uh, and and, and even though we can also don't always think about it because we, we tend to look at things in terms of area and when we do maps and we say, well, uh, I don't know, England is so big and England becomes so important and things like that. Uh, but at a certain point in the height of the Venetian Republic, even though it's only air owning this little bit of land in northern Italy and then, let's say, a bunch of islands all the way down to Crete and Cyprus and things like that and, and the Peloponnesus. And so it doesn't seem like a lot of land, but it has so many big cities in it that uh, in point of fact, it was actually, there was maybe, let's say, two million people in the Venetian Republic and may have only been three million people in the Kingdom of England. <laughs> and, uh, and the economy of the Venetian Republic would have been so much bigger that Venice, you know, was a capital then of a fairly important state in the Middle Ages, even 
it doesn't, it seems like, hmm, how could it be? It's so tiny, right? So the most serene republic of Venice, this is its <coughs> flag that dates to the Middle Ages, early modern times, um, with the winged lion. Essentially, as a republic, Venice was independent for over a thousand years. Um, the 697 date is kind of like one of those traditional dates. <laughs> you know, it's kind of emerging as independent for the first hundred years or so there, um, but then was independent until 1797. And so that's a very long and successful run kind of through the entire course of uh, late, in, you know, the the, what we think of as even the Dark Ages, but the early, you know, late antiquity, the, uh, the early modern, I'm sorry, the early medieval period, central Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, the Renaissance, all the way up through the early modern times. Uh, and that's an era when in fact we kind of associate that era anyway in Western Europe, not so much with republics, but with monarchies, right? And so um, this is a later picture of the Pope crowning Charlemagne, but it's an era when there are, are, are kings, the kings of France and England and everything else. Um, there were other republics, so republics was something that were associated with city-states and things like that, and so another <coughs> example would have been medieval and early modern Florence, but as you may uh, know, if you know a little bit of Florentine history, uh, even though the Medici family uh, start out as essentially uh, rich citizens who are part of the uh, Republican apparatus and the city government of the Republic of Florence. They later evolve into uh, monarchs of both Florence and the, the surrounding area of Tuscany and they become ultimately the Grand Dukes of Tuscany. So a lot of cases these um, republics were not, didn't have that kind of stability because they were often fell prey to um, one particular family and could be converted into monarchies or could get conquered by somebody else, right? So um, there's a quite long lasting run for the Venetians. Um, one thing that did happen to Venice is that it became more oligarchical over time. And so we'll talk a little bit about this when we talk, you know, we're talking about something about how constitutions work and constitutional theory, but essentially um, um, you can have uh, a, a republic doesn't have to um, be a democracy, right? And in fact, uh, democracy doesn't always last even in the most democratic <laughs> republics, right? And so, uh, as we've done when we talk, looked at the Athenian um, democracy, uh, how when the Athenians lost the war against the Spartans, the Spartans imposed um, the reign of the, uh, of the tyrants, and so essentially they made an <laughs> oligarchy. Uh, often a republic could just have one tyrant or it could have a, a group of oligarchs where essentially it's being run by a noble, noble class who are, they have more of the power. Or as we saw in the case of the Roman Republic, it can be kind of a mixture where you have um, some involvement of different groups that uh, have different levels of participation, um, but it ultimately becomes kind of a mixed constitution. So there is a mixed constitution in a way for Venice, but it becomes less mixed and really oligarchical <laughs> over time. So, um, so the doges start out as very, very powerful at the beginning, um, but most of these powers are lost and ultimately the doges role becomes ceremonial. In that sense, um, since there is a doge, if we think of the doge as being a monarch, do it's kind of a, um, uh, it's kind of a way, a constitutional, an early constitutional monarchy, although um, it's, it's always been name a republic, so we call, don't call it a constitutional monarchy, so we're a republic, right? So we've had recent lectures kind of on these topics, and you don't have to have been there, but we talked about, for example, as I've been mentioning, uh, the Roman Republic in one of our lectures and uh, about Magna Carta. And in both of those cases, um, as you'll recall, those also were um, quite mixed. So even though Magna Carta, we look back on that in our own tradition as this foundation of our kind of constitutional monarchy and specifically having a dem democracy or a semi-democracy in our republics that are descended from the British crown. Nevertheless, at the time, it really was only a, uh, a compact uh, between the king and the nobles, uh, the great nobles who didn't trust the king and indeed it had essentially no immediate consequences at all and only became important uh, in retrospect later. Okay, 
So constitutions are tough, <laughs> uh, and they're not easy to explain how it all works. Um, and they were kind of aware of that when I was a kid in the 1970s, and so they made on Saturday morning cartoons an entire series called Schoolhouse Rock about the, uh, that included, for example, history and, uh, and everything like that, American history, but also the complexities of how constitutional government worked. And so one of the most beloved of all of the, the little, uh, kind of, their little tiny video shorts is called I'm Just a Bill. <laughs> Uh, which is explaining the constitutional process whereby in the United States a bill can sometimes become a law. And so the bill was reminding people that he's, he may die. <laughs> yeah, die in committee. <laughs> so that's a, quite a thing to be telling, teaching seven-year-olds, right? So anyway, so seven-year-olds are learning about bills dying in committee and things like that. Uh, and so, yeah, the kind of the lyrics are things like, I'm just a bill, yes, I'm only a bill. I got as far as Capitol Hill, well now I'm stuck in committee and I'll sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be a law. How I hope and pray that they will, but today I'm still just a bill. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> he wants to be a law. Okay. Um, I love the Simpsons version. <laughs> so the Simpsons version is I'm an amendment to be. I'm an amendment to be, amendment to be, I'm hoping that they'll ratify me. There's a lot of flag burners who have got too much freedom. I want to make it legal for policemen to beat them. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so why can't we just make a law against flag burning? Because that law would be unconstitutional. But if we change the Constitution, then we could make all sorts of crazy laws. <laughs> now you're catching on. So anyway, that's the Simpsons version of that, and it's a kind of a funny one. Um, as a, uh, as a, in retrospect now, you know, because again, we've said how, how complicated uh, apparently civics lessons are for people apparently at all levels of the U.S. government. They could have made a couple more of these, like for example, <laughs> Um, if <laughs> we could have had one that kind of went asking a president of a foreign country to interfere in your domestic election <laughs> and then telling him, I'll give you, I'll unfreeze millions and millions of dollars in needed defense aid, that could mean that's the very definition of quid pro quo, <laughs> which if we go to Article 2 of the Constitution, constitutes breaking your oath of office and a high crime. So anyway, they could have had one like that. <laughs> so, so what if we did one for Venice? <laughs> so the Venetian Constitution. Uh, the Venetian Constitution is in fact more complicated. <laughs> so um, I will we'll go into it just a little bit, but I'll, uh, I'll just want to go through it slightly. So I made a chart. Essentially, the, at the basis for it, um, all of the male citizens, and not everybody gets to be a citizen, but essentially property-owning classes uh, are in the Arango, Arango which is essentially um, a, a legislature, but it is only at the beginning does it actually have any kind of legislative power, and af after a while, uh, the idea of it is, is that they all get together and they acclaim things, and one of the things... That was spelled, should it be Arango? I think it's... It's spelled G. Oh, and maybe it's the Venetian. It's because it's a Venetian word. Maybe. So Venetian is its own language. Um, and so a lot of the different words like doge are, are in their own special Venetian language, which is different from Italian, modern Italian, which is the Tuscan dialect as opposed to the Venetian. That's, that's a proper spelling. Yes, okay. Thank yeah. you. So anyway, these guys <laughs> then, um, from them is drawn and elected uh, the Great Council. <clears throat> and so at a certain point, it was 480 uh, nobles of patrician, noblemen of patrician families. Um, that eventually gets to way over 2,000. And the idea of it is that they represent, it's like how parliament is sovereign in the, in the Westminster system. So in the British parliament, parliament is sovereign in the same way the Great Council of Venice is essentially the, the sovereign body of the republic. And so then everything um, is a kind of a subcommittee of then the Great Council. And so there's a subcommittee, which is essentially a Senate, which acts as kind of the legislators. So 60 members of the Great Council are made senators, uh, and of which they are led by six savi, which is to say sages. Uh, and so they are more or less involved in making all the laws. There's a quarantia, which is 40 members of the Great Council who are acting essentially as the Supreme Court, and they have 
uh, three liters of the Corantia. Uh, there's the, very famously, the Doge, who is the chief executive of the Republic, who is elected for life. The Doge is always operating, by, the, by a certain point anyway, by the, by the time this really gets developed, uh, uh, with a group called the Minor Council. It's just six ducal councillors that are constantly with the Doge, and he can't do anything without them. They all were act together. And indeed, the, the seven of them are almost always operating with what's called the full college, which is these guys plus the three leaders of these, the six leaders of these, and then six other different Savi that have other responsibilities. And so for getting almost anything done all day long, the Doge is working with those groups, including then going and this, this college is then presiding over the Senate, and so that the Senate to do any legislation, they're all together. But at a certain point, uh, you can imagine that that's quite unwieldy already, <laughs> just even talking about it. Uh, we know from any kind of, when you're doing any kind of constitutional theory, if you're trying to get anything through uh, a legislature that has 3,000, <laughs> you know, two, 3,000 people, that's complicated. And so sometimes when there was a crisis, they, for example, they, they uh, created a temporary committee, what was called the Council of, of Ten, that had all these executive powers, again, when working in concert with the Doge and the Minor Council, so these 17 people together. Uh, that temporary committee ended up lasting 600 years uh, because it was so effective. <laughs> so, uh, and so anyway, and among them, uh, they, have a, uh, they appointed within themselves three secret inquisitors that were part of essentially uh, uh, the inner, and kind of like the secret police kind of thing, the inter interior um, espionage and also exterior. And so we'll talk about all that. But essentially with, the, with this constitution, then there are significant checks and balances on this guy for example, becoming a tyrant. Yes, I mean, Valerie. Also, I would like to point out that constitution. Constitution is not a Venetian word. Oh yeah, that is that one. That is, is a legit typo up there. misspelling. There's a typo. Mis there. A typo, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Someone online was pointing out <laughs> Johan. Yeah, John, um, was this unusual for city states of whatever time this was? Like, by when did this ripen into? M Ruff, uh, roughly by when did this ripen into yeah, so all this of this? And also, was it like unusual for, let's say, that general area, like, let's say, compared to, let's say, a city state like Genoa? You know, yeah. like, was it, was it unusual compared to other entities like that at that time? Yeah, so this would be, I would say, this is like getting to this kind of full development by the kind of central Middle Ages, so by like the 13th century. And I would say it's more complicated than almost any of their contemporaries. So even though they have um, rivals like Genoa, uh, that, uh, that are also republics. Florence is a republic at certain points. Lots of the different city-states are republics. Um, the actual governing apparatus of each one of them is just much less complicated and much less um, stable, which is one of the reasons why uh, more, mostly none of them survived as republics usually, or they would go through time periods when they would alternate between, um, let's say, having their, their republican features more or less working. And then they would also have to invite in, it's called a podesta, which is to say like a, a foreign tyrant who can actually bring peace to the city and rule over it. Uh, even though it's like you, you invite somebody who's not even from your city because you have so much blood animosity with all of your you know, fellow nobles and you hate them all so much, you know, that you can't get any one of them, you can't let any one of them be in charge. So you get somebody you know, from outside to be the prince. And so a lot of, uh, and often, usually a Venetian, <laughs> you know, actually bring one of these Venetians, because they, because one of the things you know about bringing a Venetian in is you know that the guy is not going to want to stay. He's only making like a name for himself as a as a as a ruler of your unruly <laughs> city, and then he's going to want to go back to Venice because Venice is better, <laughs> you know. So he's going to have a palace back there. So he's just making money while he's kind of sorting out all your problems. So yeah, I would say it's a little different. Okay, so the head of state, the Doge. So um, we talked last week, if you were here, um, about essentially the, uh, the last, the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the kingdom of the Ostrogoths, and then how the Ostrogoths got destroyed by the East Roman Empire, the Byzantines, when the Byzantines retook Italy. So after that happened, uh, the Byzantine control or the East Roman control of Italy was very weak. And so when a new group of much more um, let's say barbaric barbarians, you know, the Ostrogoths had been quite uh, Romanized. The Lombards were only semi, not pagans anymore. So when the Lombards came in, um, they were able to overrun all of the kind of East Roman control. Uh, however, they weren't able to um, 
unify the kingdom, the, the peninsula. And so uh, the kingdom of Lombardy didn't control everything. And as a result of that, ever since from, from this moment, from the Lombard invasion up through the modern unification of the Italian state, Italy was not again unified. So uh, refugees then uh, from the area around Venice kind of made their way uh, to the sea where their Lombards were less likely to get them. <laughs> and one of the places they went then is to the kind of the different islands that started to make up Venice. And together they organize, they could be organized as what we would call anyway the Duchy of Venetia, although uh, this word, um, we have a lot of more recent connotations of a duchy, right? So this is a word in Latin, uh, dukes. So this is a Roman title, which means dukes just means leader. Uh, and so it is organized essentially by the East Romans, the Byzantines, the people from Constantinople. So by acclamation, one of the number of these guys, one of the noblemen was elected a duke. And then they send away to Constantinople uh, to get confirmation of that title. So the emperor in Constantinople writes back and says, oh yes, you're a duke and you have to be under me now. Uh, I give you legitimacy if you recognize my authority. That's been Constantinople's game this entire time. That's how they were able, as you remember, to essentially overwhelm the Ostrogoths too. They always, you know, if they can't, if they don't have the strength, they at least can give you the legitimation. This solves a problem, I've, a question I've had for a long time about the word doge, doge. It's obviously a variant of duce. Yeah, yeah, duce yeah, too. Duce. So like, yeah, in Italian, duce is like the same it's, word. It's, yeah, and doge, doge, and so duke, it's, and it's who is similar. This? Who is the man in the picture? He, he's familiar. He, I took a bunch of portraits of different doges, uh -huh. <laughs> and I just, they, they all kind of, they, anyway, they, they, they dress distinctively, right? So the doges have this hat yeah. that is possibly based on a Phrygian cap, and so, which is like a Smurf hat. And so the, um, I don't know why the Smurfs have Phrygian caps, but anyway, the idea <laughs> of a Phrygian cap all the way back to antiquity is that that's a sign of, of civic liberty. And so maybe the doge is wearing that hat because he's saying, okay, this is a republic, you know, and, and it's, he's uh, expressing their freedoms, although who knows. It's not entirely, sh it's a tradition, and so it goes all the way back, and they're not, they, people also say, well, it looks a lot like the pharaoh's crown as well, and maybe the Phrygians got it from there, so who knows. Um, so that's the doge. So we mentioned then that um, where we were at in kind of history, and so this is like the year 600, so we remember Justinian, and the East Roman Empire had uh, mortgaged everything, took all the, stripped all the gold off all the churches and everything like that in order to bring troops, knock out the Ostrogoths, knock out the Vandals, and even uh, get some of the Visigoths to submit here and essentially bring back uh, the Roman Empire to its traditional Western heartland, uh, but never profitably. So the armies uh, more or less destroyed Italy in doing it and so wiped out the economy. And so when the Lombards who had been up here uh, made their way down, they then found uh, their own states. So the kingdom of Pavia here, which is to say Lombardy, uh, and then the Lombard duchies of Tuscany, Spoleto, and Benevento. So essentially the Lombards own the lion's share, but all of the uh, areas around the periphery, including that last capital of the Roman Empire, Ravenna, and also then the heartland, I mean, Rome itself, where the Pope is, that is still essentially owned by Byzantium at this point. But they can't defend it against Lombards, generally speaking. So the wars go on and continue to destroy uh, Italy's economy, and that is when um, essentially the people that are just from all of this kind of territory who are still considering themselves Romans and nobles, they make their way you know, into what becomes here this duchy uh, of Venetia, which had been, this is what the Roman province had been called. Uh, and that's what, where the name Venice, which becomes associated with the, the city, uh, comes from the fact that essentially it's the heir to all of uh, these refugees from the previously whole big territory, but increasingly Lombards are just taking it all from them, right? And so then this area right here is able to maintain its independence because they have kind of a little bit of naval support from the Byzantines whose capital in Italy here is Ravenna, just right next to it. And so that's one of the reasons why they're there. Another um, just you know, weird thing that, has, that had existed is Aquileia had been a big metropolis in the Western Roman Empire, and it had a high-ranking Christian bishop. So the only one of the bishops in the West that was called a patriarch. Uh, 
Patriarch of Aquileia. And so kind of slowly over time, the patriarchs had to kind of flee to Grotto. And then, but then when they did, then the other people that were back there still elected a new patriarch. <laughs> and so then there were multiple patriarchs. Then the Venetians went and grabbed the guy at Grotto and brought him here so that they could have that title patriarch. Anyway, so then there started to be lots of different patriarchs, but essentially it was a way for the Venetians anyway to claim that their bishop uh, is a, this higher ranking guy, the highest ranking guy essentially in the West after the Pope. And so uh, the patri and still to this day, the patriarch of um, Venice is the second um, ranking uh, Latin priest in Italy, so after, after the Pope in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they finally, the Venetians were finally able to extinguish, extinguish the Patriarchate of Aquileia in like 1800 or something. It's a long time to get rid of those guys. <laughs> anyway, so they're all kind of forming together as refugees. They're not all immediately uh, here, but in, in where, where Venice is going to be. Um, specifically, they're, they're more likely to be on these islands, at least at first. Okay, as time is kind of going on, uh, there's a further, the next century, um, there's kind of further collapse of East Roman power, the Byzantine, as we're now calling them, power. I don't know if you can kind of even see this, but essentially Slavs have come in and have overrun most of the Balkans. And meanwhile, after an exhaustive war that the East Romans were fighting with the Persians, both the, Pers the Persian Empire gets totally wiped out by this new force of Islam, the Arabs, who end up creating a very um, vibrant and powerful uh, state, the Umayyad Caliphate here, uh, which continuously is trying to take Constantinople but can't. So Constantinople is this uh, amazing uh, fortified city surrounded by water, having vast, amazing walls, and so um, you have to have lots of naval power and land power in order to get it, and they never have both. The um, Byzantines, one of the things they're able to have right up to the end is they have kind of like this technology called Greek fire where they can uh, shoot fire at the opposing boats, and even underwater or something, and it, and it lights them all on fire, and it's like you can't do anything when your boat's on fire. <laughs> so anyway, so... Yeah, we still don't have a, a, how to make it do it work, right? Um, yeah, we don't necessarily need it. Anyway, so um, we can kind of see then, at this point, the Venetians um, are, are hardly getting anything from Constantinople. Constantinople is, if anything, trying to get some help out of them, uh, if they can. Uh, and so the Venetians at this point are just refugees that are kind of clinging to the coast. And their initial economy is essentially, they have, uh, they have the salt pans in the Po. So they've got swamps and they've got water and salt and they uh, establish for themselves a monopoly on selling salt in the whole area. Uh, and then they jealously guard that monopoly for a thousand years after that, but it's not, initially it's their economy and that's what they are able to do. Okay, and so one of the things you notice when you go to Venice uh, is that it, a lot of things about it, are, there are things that seem kind of Byzantine. So if you go to uh, St. Mark's, um, just like in Ravenna when we were seeing all those mosaics and we were seeing these kind of um, uh, domed churches that are built in what we think of like a Greek cross, so more like a Byzantine uh, cathedral, a Byzantine church with gold mosaics and things like that. In this way, it's a, in part because um, the Venetians initially are in fact, although they're always Latin speakers, and then later their, their language evolves into Venetian, um, they are always essentially looking to Constantinople as that's their, maybe their emperor was the one in Constantinople, and then later even when they're more independent, they nevertheless have vast commercial ties with Constantinople as long as the Eastern Empire exists. Uh, and so as a result of that, they are constantly bringing back styles and fashions and art and everything like that from the Greek East, even long after everybody else in the Latin West has stopped learnt knowing Greek and they don't, you know, so they're not, um, all that, we always talk about how all that Greek learning isn't even available to anybody in the West because they don't, you know, they can't speak Greek, et cetera, but the Venetians are still in touch. Okay, you get to the next century, and we get to 800, the year Charlemagne is crowned emperor. So now, uh, Charlemagne has knocked out the Lombards, and so his Frankish empire, uh, in alliance with the Pope, uh, has become quite powerful. The Byzantine Empire, meanwhile, is at a quite a low ebb uh, when that's happening. Uh, but the Venetians are successfully able to negotiate a treaty between the two empires uh, which more or less makes it 
autonomous. So both empires kind of recognize that the Venetians are allowed to exist neutrally and not be owned by either, either one of them. And so that ends up being quite a good thing for the Venetians uh, in terms of their overall um, capacity of, of being an independent republic. So even though they, they, date, they date their independence from earlier, now it's becoming recognized here in the 800s. Um, this is also a time period um, when uh, uh, there's starting to be um, Western shipping again. So the Italians are getting back in boats and they are starting to participate in trade that had been kind of dominated by uh, Arabs up until now. And so one of these um, early city-states to emerge is called Amalfi. And uh, although Amalfi wasn't very famous until recently, people now have also determined that and realized that Amalfi is an amazing tourist trap to go to too. <laughs> and so Amalfi is a gorgeous little place that doesn't even have a proper harbor. So it's almost hard to believe that anybody was able to make it a mercantile uh, city-state and it's because they had such primitive boats back then. But essentially the Amalfitans were able to get in these little boats and they had the right currents and they were able to get to uh, Alexandria uh, and that's where, and, and participate in very lucrative trade. Uh, everybody in the East had all of the things that everybody in the West wanted. So they had spices, they had silk, they had manufactured goods, papyrus, this kind of thing that you can get from Egypt. Uh, they did not have any of those things to trade with the Egyptians, with the Arabs. So what did they, what did they trade? Fish. Fish are, everybody can get fish anywhere and they're heavy to carry around. <laughs> People, yeah, so people. So um, this is this time period where the Balkans here have been overrun by this group that call themselves the Slavs. And so one of the things that's happening is Italians are going and capturing them. And this is where our word slave comes from. Uh, they're bringing Slavs to uh, the Arabs and selling them. But also is happening is they are raiding the Lombard territories, the Italians, and they're also depopulating uh, Italy and just selling Italians in, the, um, in Cairo and Alexandria. And that's not actually, they don't usually tell you that part of the story, <laughs> but that's actually where the early kind of commercial wealth is kind of coming from uh, for these mercantile republics. And so the, the Pope and everybody are saying, don't do that, stop that. Um, but they are not listening to that because they are making too much money by doing that kind of thing. So, so that's kind of the beginnings of mercantile republics. So one of the things that happens then, while the Venetians are down there in Alexandria, which has become uh, a Muslim country, it had been uh, a very important, Egypt had been one of the centers of early Christianity and a big Christian nation, uh, especially Alexandria had been uh, a center of one of the patriarchates. And so that patriarchate, the patriarch of Alexandria, uh, looked back to one of these early, um, important Christians traditionally in the same way that the popes consider themselves to be heirs of St. Peter and St. Paul. Uh, so St. Mark is the founder, in according to tradition, of the uh, Patriarchate of Alexandria. And so as far as the Alexandrians were concerned, they had the tomb that had St. Mark in it. Um, and there were still lots of Egyptians who were Christian who were venerating that and everything like that. But the Venetians um, are trading there all the time and they decide they, it, St. Mark would be better off in Venice <laughs> you know, than, uh, than in his homeland here of Alexandria, so they go and steal the body. And according to the um, legend, uh, they have some, the help of a couple of the um, Coptic or Egyptian Christian monks, uh, and then they put the body and all the relics uh, at the bottom of a, a big basket of, that had pork in it. So then the Muslims wouldn't, the expectors wouldn't be willing to go in there, right? And so that's, <laughs> I feel like that has to be just made up. But because, I mean, if you, you'd always know to hide things in pork. The Muslim <laughs> inspectors would know that, right? Anyway, so whether that is true or not, but anyway, that's what they made in the mosaic. <laughs> so anyway, and so they brought it back. Um, the, the Egyptians, the Coptic Christians don't agree that this happened. Um, and so ultimately the, uh, the compromise in the tradition is that uh, they got the body but the head stayed and so that's kind of like the compromise. <laughs> so, so the head is still there as far as the cops are concerned. And there still is a patriarch of Alexandria who is the Pope of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Okay, so 
This then is where this symbol comes from. So I showed you that uh, flag, that's the Venetian flag, which has this winged lion. And so in early Christian iconography, and actually all the way to this day, there are four canonical gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, and they are represented by four beasts that are in the vision of John the Revelator in the book of Revelations, which are in fact just a rerun of a vision that Isaiah had, but essentially they are a winged bull, a winged eagle, I already have wings, so I'm just a regular eagle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a winged lion, uh, and a, just a guy with wings, <laughs> you know, so, so anyway, with those four, the one with the lion with the wings is, is Mark, and so since the Phoenicians, you know, at least say they have uh, evangelist Mark, um, that's why that becomes then a symbol uh, of, the, of the Republic and the city, and why the basilica is called St. Mark's, because that's where St. Mark's remains are. Okay, so by the next century now, um, the Frankish Empire has split, and this is ultimately going to become a permanent split, and so the West Frankish Kingdom is ultimately going to evolve into France, the East Frankish Kingdom is going to evolve into what we call Germany, but is in fact actually the heir to Charlemagne's empire, so at the time it's called the Roman Empire, or the, the West, or the Western Roman Empire, or the Holy Roman Empire, we sometimes say, which ultimately controls kind of all of this territory. And now, um, there's also a vast increase in uh, population and goods and manufacturing, all kinds of things that are starting to happen in the West. And so there's also a rise in additional um, competitors for trade. Uh, Amalfi, which has this really bad port, essentially goes into eclipse at a certain point, and it becomes kind of a, a fight between kind of the Venetians and the Pisans, and later Genoa uh, eclipses the Pisans. And so anyway, Venice and Genoa are the, are the famous rivals, right? But you can also see what's happened here is this Arab caliphate has not stayed in one piece, and so now it's split apart and is no longer um, able to be aggressively pushing forward anymore, and so now um, that golden era of uh, the height of Islam is going is down, and now the West is resurging, right? And see, Sicily is green. Sicily is green here for a while. Because the Muslims oh. conquered it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so in terms of, so this is not the final border, right? <laughs> because we can still see here that the East Romans, even though they had lost a lot of the Balkans, as the Bulgarians are here, um, they have maintained their control of all of Anatolia, what we now think of as Turkey, which was still then Christian and Greek speaking, right? Um, but Spain, for example, uh, is Muslim all the way up to here at this point, and Sicily is Muslim. So ultimately, the, when, it, the end, the, when the whole thing ends, this is going to be Muslim and this is going to be Christian. Okay. So let's fast forward a little bit, otherwise we can't go through every map. <laughs> so 200 more years and just want to get to, as that uh, extends, kind of one of the things that happens <laughs> is um, another, another problem that, uh, that the Muslim states here, especially Egypt face, is um, deforestation. So at a certain point, uh, uh, the Egyptian fleet is destroyed and they can't build any more fleet. <laughs> um, there's, no more, there's no more wood for them to start building fleet, whereas the Venetians um, always are trying to conquer uh, essentially the, cro the coast of Croatia, uh, Dalmatia here, because there's all this timber, and so they go over there to get the wood, and they, there's all kinds of wood actually all around here, so the Venetians aren't having too much problem with that. Uh, and so now um, Venice and Genoa, um, at this moment when the West is becoming very populous, rich, and militarily strong, and you can see the Islamic states are especially divided this is, this is now right at, in the wake then of that first crusade where uh, knights from France and Germany trekked all the way along here, through here, all the way across, uh, and, and created these crusader states. So there's the crusader kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, but part of the reason why they were able to do that is because there had been all of this um, collapse of central authority, right? Okay. So as the Crusades are going, that's only making the Venetians and Genoese richer because they're able to now trade between uh, Christian states, Western Latin Christian states, 
that are now helping them control all of that trade to the getting that access to those spices and silk and all those Eastern goods. Um, and so, but one of the things that happens as the crusading movement goes on, uh, between the first and fourth crusades, just warfare in general gets radically more expensive. It's completely impossible at a certain point for knights to simply uh, traipse tra across all of uh, Europe and try to forage the whole way. And so as a result of that, they have to, when they want to launch a, the fourth crusade, contract with either Genoa or Venice in order to get boats in order to get there. Um, they do contract with the Venetians uh, to get themselves and their horses uh, all the way to the Holy Land. Um, but when they, um, an insufficient number of crusaders show up to pay for all of the, ho the boats that they wanted, and they also had not enough money even if they had had enough crusaders, so, uh, and the Venetians are not going to go and do this on their own uh, dime. But uh, it happened to be at this particular moment there was uh, about the Cagius Doge ever, so Enrico Dandolo, uh, and he says, well, you know, <laughs> guys, I got an idea. You know, you don't have the money and you're not liable to get the money, uh, but what if, uh, you know, you are, you are sort of in the night business, and so what, we have this, we've been having this problem uh, with this uh, city-state uh, in Croatia that has been kind of rebelling against us, and in fact it considers itself to be an independent republic and all these things, and we don't consider there to be any independent republics in the Adriatic because we own the <laughs> Adriatic. So if you help us, uh, they do have big walls and we haven't had enough troops to be able to ever take them, but if you help us take uh, uh, Zara, then, then uh, we, can, we can consider part of your, uh, what you owe us paid. And so the Crusaders think about it and like, oh, okay, we'll do that. So um, they go and do a little mercenary work, they go to Zara, the Crusaders are able to take the city where the Venetians couldn't, so the Venetians accept the city as part of the payment. Uh, when they get there though, uh, one of the things that happens is a, an exiled, uh, deposed East Roman Emperor, Byzantine Emperor, shows up and says, hey, I need help getting my, my throne back. <laughs> um, and if you come, I know you guys are going on a crusade, that's really important, I love crusading. Um, if, you, if you put me back on my throne, um, and then I'll pay for a whole bunch of uh, troops and give you all the rest of the money you need to pay the Venetians, because Byzantines are rich, as you know, and I will uh, have, send a whole bunch more troops with you. And so it'll be like, you know, like a two, you know, win, 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 right? And so they go, then the crusade gets hijacked a second time. The Pope just keeps on writing, no, no, <laughs> no, don't do that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the Venetians successfully then hijack the crusade again, which goes to Constantinople. Um, it successfully puts the claimant, uh, after a little bit of fighting, it puts the claimant on, back on the throne, whereupon he finds out that the treasury is absolutely empty. <laughs> he can't pay them anything. Uh, the Crusaders are not, and the, especially the Venetians, they're the ones in charge of the boats, are not willing to leave without being paid. Uh, and so that, uh, there's a couple of bad incidents, and ultimately uh, it comes down to war, and the Crusade then lays siege to the capital of Eastern Christendom itself, you know, Constantine's Christian capital. Uh, and the only uh, time until the fall later to the Turks, Constantinople falls um, uh, to Christian Crusaders. Uh, and when that happens then, uh, it gets massively despoiled. So this city that had never fallen before and it's just filled, uh, had been the biggest city in Christendom, just filled with gold and artifacts and relics. If you thought getting St. Mark was a big deal, these guys got everything, you know? And so uh, this is where these famous horses, you know, which had been set up in the Forum in Constantinople, now they are, are taken as spoil back to Venice and they're put on top of St. Mark's to show we've despoiled Constantinople and the Doge, as part of the deal, when he uh, makes it, before they do this, they makes a big contract with the Crusaders about who's gonna get what uh, out of this empire when they conquer it. Uh, and the Doge is able to uh, uh, get the deal that he gets a quarter and a half of a quarter. <laughs> so in other words, three eighths of all of the Byzantine empire when they conquer it. And so after this, the Doge calls himself that he's, he's a you know, lord of a quarter and half quarter of the Roman Empire, <laughs> you know? And of course he takes all the best parts, right? And so his quarter is all the islands and everywhere he can make a trading depot so that the Venetians now can trade all the way up into the Black Sea for free on their own basis. Okay, and so there's a, the, the Latin crusaders stuff their own kind of, they, one of them gets crowned emperor, one of them gets crowned king of 
uh, Thessalonica, one of them gets made Duke of Athens, one of them's Prince of Achaia. Anyway, so they, they kind of d divvy that up. One of them is Duke of Archipelago. Anyway, and so all of those guys each own something, but they're all very, um, it's very nothing compared to this, all this green here, right? Which is all the Venetian territory all the way through. Uh, and ultimately then the Greeks who form their own states, the Desperate of Epirus and the Empire of Nicaea. The Empire of Nicaea ultimately does conquer back the Latin Empire and so the Byzantine Empire is reformed, but it never, it never recovers to what it was before the Crusaders do it in. And that of course is the death blow to the relationship between the Greek church and the Latin church. They don't recover from that either. But, for the Venetians, <laughs> this ends up being just a wonderful time for them to be in charge of a trade route that takes them from Venice through Constantinople to the Black Sea because in the 13th and 14th century, the Mongols uh, come out of the steppes, conquer China and all of uh, Persia and Iraq and even Russia uh, and create this empire where suddenly you can now, uh, because it's all under the control of the Khan, you can go all the way across here without being raided by independent little tribes and so suddenly there's a direct overland caravan route that is bringing you uh, things from China. And so this is obviously quite good for business as far as the Venetians are concerned. So this becomes a very um, uh, high time and this is also then, as we see here, this route here, this is not a trade route, this is the route of Marco Polo. And so Marco Polo, who is a Venetian, who uh, goes with his family and becomes actually an official of the Khan. Uh, not a very high official, but anyway, he spends a bunch of time there and makes his way back by the sea route to Venice, where he also, in the war, gets made a uh, prisoner. Yes? <coughs> what are the Venetians giving to the um, east of him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, they can spice, they get this, they get this and that. But yeah. Um, so now there's going to start to be, I mean, there's definitely um, like, so like different kinds of cloth, so like wool and other kinds of textiles. There's more, there's manufacturing that is taking place in places like Florence, uh, you know, of different kinds of cloth and textiles. Um, there are, I'm, I'm not sure what, I'm, I, I should know that better. I'm sorry to say I have to look it up, but yeah, they, they, I always feel like the, um, the Westerners have a lot less to trade, <laughs> you know, than the Easterners do. The Chinese always feel that way too. <laughs> They're never interested in the West. <laughs> you know, so. Okay, so um, that's kind of an overview of like some of the maps and some of how this uh, republic in, as a mercantile republic is kind of growing and taking advantage of its economic circumstances. I want to look a little bit about um, then the development, its development as a republic. So in this whole kind of time period, um, uh, a lot of uh, contemporary offices uh, went from being elective to being hereditary. So we very much tend to think of kings as being, you know, hereditary. That Prince William is going to become, you know, well, Prince Charles is going to become King Charles uh, when the Queen dies, and then and William is going to become king after him, because uh, that's just how it always goes because it's a hereditary monarchy here in Canada. But um, uh, in fact, actually, uh, like the kings of France um, the, uh, always were elected initially by acclamation. And so one of the reasons why this house, the House of Capet, so you know the Capetians whose symbol is now the symbol of France, right? So these lilies, that's the symbol of the House of Hugh Capet, the Capetian royal family. Um, they, the only reason why they got in was because they um, uh, were, would have elections against the last kind of... Uh, Carolingians who tended to be, um, you know, like people like Charles the Lame, Charles the Bald, Charles the Unre you know, I mean, all these Charleses, the, the Charles the Simple. <laughs> so in other words, these are not, you know, great, the top of the barrel Charleses anymore. <laughs> and so then the Capetians are able to get elected kings until, until that Hugh Capet is elected and then he is able to successfully get his son made king in his own lifetime. And then even though they're very wimpy or uh, unrich and, and have hardly any territory, the Capetians are really good at having just one son and making that son be king in the king's lifetime. And that's what makes it a hereditary monarchy. And that's how hereditary monarchy evolves. Um, so the reality of this kind of thing is the way elections have been happening, this kind of election by acclamation, that continued to be a problem in the 
um, in the Roman Empire of the East in Constantinople until the end of the empire, really, because it had always been the case that you know Julius Caesar essentially is emperor because his troops say that call him imperator, right? And so it's always possible for the army to declare you by acclamation emperor, and then there's sometimes multiple emperors and they fight it out in a civil war, right? Well, so that same kind of thing then is in the inherited reality uh, of election by acclamation, you end up having disputes, and so this is why. Uh, initially, that's how the papacy works. So the Roman people acclaim who's pope. Well, sometimes they acclaim two people, pope, you know, depending some parts of them to claim one and the other. And that's why we have a pope and an anti-pope, right? Often. Well, so the, uh, the popes over time, they create an electoral system where the cardinals elect popes, and that's to stop this from happening if possible, and it hasn't happened in a long time. Uh, and likewise, um, uh, the Venetians come up with their own thing, right? So although um, there is this uh, attempt early on from several of the doges to have their sons or their sons to take over from their fathers and even to go a couple generations, uh, there's attempts to make a dynasty where one of the leading families is going to maybe uh, take claim to the role of doge. In fact, actually, there's enough competition from wealthy noble families that the other ones all prevented each other from ever uh, grabbing hold of it. And so... Um, although the, uh, the doge, when is elected, ends up staying doge for life in almost every case. A couple of them got deposed, um, but uh, that continues to the republic's end. So does the elective nature of it. So they always elect a doge as opposed to having it be inherited from your, from your father. Um, also initially, uh, just like anywhere, you know, based on this model of an uh, imperial official, based on the model of, uh, of the Roman emperor, a duke, of uh, Venetia, um, the original doges would have had a lot of power, uh, but because of this rising power of the rest of the aristocracy of this oligarchy, uh, as they continuously check the authority of, of the doge, um, the doge gets less and less and less power until by the end of the republic we'll see uh, it's essentially a ceremonial role entirely. So. Okay, if we're going to make a schoolhouse rock, how do you be a doge? <laughs> so, let's do that. I mean, it um, can't possibly be as complicated as making a bill of law in the U.S. Congress, right? <laughs> so, we have to start with that point of sovereignty. So I said that essentially like Parliament that uh, is sovereign, so too the Great Council of Venice is sovereign. And so it, at a certain point is consisting of 480 men. They're elected annually from patrician families that are listed in what's called the Golden Book of Venice. At a certain point, it's fixed. You can't add anybody to the Venetian nobility. And so it becomes more and more aristocratic. And originally, you could get to be a rich merchant and make your, buy your way in. Uh, eventually, they close it off. You have to be in the Golden Book. And the way you get there is because you, were, you can get elected into the council because you already were on the council or because your paternal ancestors very recently were. And so essentially it's closed to anybody whose, whose family line, male family line, uh, is not um, uh, already part of the oligarchy. Uh, and so that's where the council comes. This develops over time. I'm trying to put it together in one, in one snapshot, but it's a thousand year republic. <laughs> Okay, so how do you elect a doge? So from that council, we remember there's all these subcommittees, and one of those is called the Signoria, uh, which consists of that minor council, those six ducal councilors who follow the doge around, and then that Quarantia, which was uh, also working as a, as a court system, right? So it's 40 electors. So the Signoria together, then, from the Signoria, you take the youngest member of the Signoria. So this is step one. <laughs> Take the youngest guy out of the Signoria. He goes to St. Mark's to pray, uh, and that's step one. <laughs> step two, he leaves the basilica, finds the first boy he finds. Step three, <laughs> he brings that boy to the Doge's palace uh, before the great council. That boy now becomes the Ballotino, <laughs> so the ballot boy. So the ballot boy is in charge of, um, anyway, all the next steps, <laughs> this, or at least in terms of the picking. So. Oh. Um, next, all of the members of the Great Council who are 30 years old and older get their name written on a ballot. All of those are put into the urn, and the ballotino draws 30 names out of the urn. That creates 30 electors now. So the 30 electors write their names on a ballot, they put it in the urn. The boy draws nine names out of the, out of the urn, and now there's nine electors. 
Okay, the nine electors, now they contemplate the whole grand council of everybody 30 years older and older, and they say, um, I'm, we're gonna elect 40 of them, 40 of those members, but those guys, in order to get elected into that 40, seven, they gotta get seven out of nine votes. So as you can imagine, anybody who's unpopular isn't gonna get, you know, depending on who the Ballotino has gotten to this group of nine, right? Anyway, so this nine uh, is going to elect then 40 electors. Those 40 electors have their names written on the ballots. The Ballotino pulls <laughs> 12 names out, <laughs> creating 12 electors. The 12 electors contemplate the Grand Council of Venice. <laughs> And they, they elect 25 electors, each one of them which requires 9 out of the 12 of the votes. Now those 20, what are you going to think we're going to do with those 25? <laughs> Any guesses? They put their names on the ballots and they put it in the urn. The Ballotino <laughs> draws out 9. The 9 electors contemplates <laughs> the <laughs> Grand Council. They want to elect 45 electors now, of which they need a seven out of nine votes to get in. The 45, <laughs> 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 with their name on the ballots, the Ballotino pulls out 11. Okay. <laughs> Can it go on? <laughs> no, okay. The 11 <laughs> contemplate <laughs> the Great Council. They make 41, and they need a nine out of 11 vote <laughs> again. Waha. Okay, that's the preliminary. <laughs> now we're ready to start the election. <laughs> so now we have gotten the 41 electors whose job it is to choose the toast. <laughs> if you can imagine. That's the system. So here we go. You did this for 1,000 years. No, but for like 400. <laughs> so, I mean, at first they don't have this system, but at a certain point there's an electoral reform and they create the system, yeah. And so they kidnap this they kidnapped this little boy, and somewhere some family is wondering why he's gone for months. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that everybody is plotting to have their boy, you know, right outside of St. Mark's because, it, you know, it, it, I mean, you can imagine that one of the reasons why they're doing this is there's some very famous, so these are all very rich aristocrats. They are all in competition with each other. They all could be massively enriched potentially if they, you know, somebody from, they or somebody from their family become the doge. And if you're blood enemy or whatever, if you think of like the Romeo and Juliet story, so if, you know, if you're the, they're Montagues and there's going to be this Capulet Doge, you're like, ah, you know, so you probably want to get a little Montague boy, you know, just in case he's like, I mean, he's not, he's not allowed to be doing that with the ballots, right? But you don't want to have any advantage you can have. Um, so anyway, so yeah, I agree that they'll never get their boy back. Okay, <laughs> so it takes a long time. So. So now we have the, this is step 13 and 14. So now we have the 41 electors. They all have to go to mass uh, in St. Mark's. And so in the middle of this kind of august religious thing where you're just thinking about uh, God and the Republic, uh, they then swear an oath to act honestly, uprightly, and for the good of the Republic in their job as electors. Step 15, they are now locked in the palace. <laughs> Uh, there's a special guard of sailors that is not allowing anybody in or out and also uh, is not allowing any communication in or out as long as they are, um, until they come up with their decision. So that's actually kind of like what happens with the Pope electoral reform, right? So the cardinals are not allowed to leave um, and actually at a certain point they, are, like, they stop giving them food. <laughs> you know, so, so what ends up happening with the cardinals in the Middle Ages is that like the food is reduced by half and the cardinals, you know, they, a lot of cardinals like their food, <laughs> you know, and so anyway, and then a half again, and so until, until they, and that's why they, we have that ritual still where they, depends on the smoke, right, as, they, as the ballots are being, in the, and you want to see what the smoke is, because that's coming again out of the same kind of time period, so the only way they're communicating potentially is, you know, like whatever the smoke is coming out, because they're not allowed in, out. All right, okay, so they're locked in there. Um, next, the 41 guys, <laughs> they all write down now who they think should be uh, the doge, so they nominate somebody, they put that in the urn, the ballot boy's gone, so don't worry about him anymore. <laughs> and so, um, so now um, from that, they draw a list up of everybody who's been nominated, so somebody might have gotten 20 nominations out of the 40, right? And so they just have a list, one name only, one ballot only for everybody nominated. <laughs> 
Uh, that goes back in the urn. Uh, and then, uh, I think we're in step 18. Anyway, anyway, whatever step it is now. <laughs> a, um, a, what happens then is, is that a single name is drawn out of the urn. And so if that person happens to be there, um, then they you know, go away. They're not, they're not allowed to be part of the consideration. Anybody with their same uh, surname isn't allowed to be there. So, so yeah, if you're, you know, again, whether it's Capulets or whatever, you can't, you can't all be there. You have to leave. So when that happens, then everybody who uh, is left in the room then can discuss uh, whether they want to have that guy uh, be, and then the guys can come back and answer charges or answer questions, whatever. Uh, and then they, if 25 out of those 41 electors uh, say he's Doge, then the guy gets elected Doge. And that's how you elect a Doge. <laughs> so. Um, but if, if not, <laughs> you know, if it doesn't get up to the needed 25, then you go back to that step, step 17 and you pick the second name out of the urn, right? And so then they, they try again. So it's kind of amazing that anybody ever got elected Doge. <laughs> but uh, that was, it's quite a, a constitutional system. Yeah. And then so how long would a ter his term be? I mean, is until it almost dies. time to elect the next one? <laughs> until he dies. Oh. So until you, until you successfully poison him. <laughs> and so for that reason, you know, they do the same exact thing that they do with popes, which is, okay, if you, if you don't, if you're like, it's looking like you, your faction doesn't have the strength to get your guy in as Doge, the, the, um, the compromise is always, well, we'll just name this really old guy, you know, from the kind of like a passive faction, right? So my faction's strong, your faction's strong. Between the two of us, we'll never get to 25 because we each have um, too many to, uh, in the amount of the electors. So they find a compromised guy, you know, and then what always happens, this always happens with the Pope too. You get that Pope crown on his head. <laughs> and then suddenly he lives on another 20 years and, and he's also, you know, like a real reformer or anything is gonna happen. So, because once the crown's on your head, who knows what's gonna happen, right? And so this, again, is why um, actually that pope who hijacks the crusade, uh, Dandolo, he's really old and he's also blind and everything by the time when he's leading the crusade, but he still lives on another 15 years or whatever and is able to do all these things, right? So a lot of times that, that kind of thing will happen as a way because he, he's, he's got it until he dies. Okay. <sighs> <sighs> So why does Canada have a queen again? <laughs> so, um, so you know, we thought maybe that the Canadian system of government was complicated as we're in an election right now and we're trying to, um, you know, understand between the different parties and understand if we get, you know, to what percentage within each riding is that going to cause, you know, a tsunami, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to overwhelm and have it, you know, sweep everybody out, sweep everybody in or whatever is going to happen. Um, but one of the reasons why um, maybe, you know, that we still have this kind of system and there's no way, for example, that to even contemplate unhaving it, you know, not having the queen. Um, uh, in New Zealand, for example, uh, they went through this, they, they just desperately need a new flag because they just have a Union Jack and their flag looks like the Australian flag. You can't tell it apart. And, and why do you have the British flag on your, in your country's flag at a certain point? And they spent like $20 million trying to get a new flag and they ultimately voted not to do anything. <laughs> anyway, so it's very hard to make those kind of changes. Well, likewise, um, um, there, there's, it, this is not an easy thing to unravel, you know, a inherited constitution and it not, doesn't always necessarily a wise thing to do it either. So there's a reason why, even though there, you know, this, um, this what seems like almost insane and certainly funny, you know, <laughs> complexity of the Venetian system. And yet their constitution, as opposed to the Genoese or anybody else, you know, th this actually um, costs stability, right? <laughs> so it's just, <laughs> I don't think you remember uh, the adoption of the, of the uh, maple leaf flag. I don't remember it personally because no, I wasn't no. bored. No, <laughs> great <laughs> flag debate. There was oh, there was, there was hell to pay. All, all sorts of people shouting at each other, and of course, once it was adopted, everybody loved it. Yeah. But there's a wonderful story. I don't know who the hero of this story was, but one of the premier. Um, stand-up comics from the States was in Toronto during the great flag debate and the press asked him what he thought of a country that didn't even have its own flag. He said, it's a start. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs>
Okay. So, um, like I say, this arcane system then is actually kind of a source <laughs> of stability um, since, uh, anyway, it's quite resilient to all of this pomp and having, to, having done all this. It made the system work for them. Okay, so for example, um, there emerged by this time as the power of the West Roman Emperor also collapsed as the people who are essentially kings of Germany are ceasing to be able to control or make their control felt across the Alps. Um, ultimately, all of the kind of imperial territories um, emerge as semi-free city-states uh, into the 14th century and into and then the emergence of the Renaissance later. Um, and so one of the things, one of the reasons why there is a Renaissance is because we are having um, all of this kind of frenetic co uh, competition among all of these. Um, but the other thing that is accompanied by it, it's not just art, you know, it's, you can see here with all the little battles, right? <laughs> There's also just unending warfare between city-states because that's kind of one of the things that also happens. So, you know, we've noted this before, <laughs> that there's something about city-states, so the Italian Renaissance being an example uh, in terms of having art and all kinds of ideas and things coming out of it. Uh, similarly, the city-states of ancient Greece with all of the kind of ideas coming out of there. Uh, the Mayans also had this amazing um, cultural flourishing and never had an empire, but they were also all at war at all times. So they were not, that's not a stable uh, system. And one of the things that um, happens almost always is um, big landed empires end up knocking them out uh, as the bigger powers are able to field much stronger militaries and, uh, uh, in the end than a city-state can. So, um, you know, Venice is definitely um, uh, taking part in all of that flourishing of Italian culture that involved, one of the reasons why it's just this magnificent thing, so the Doge's Palace here, uh, it's generally considered to be the premier example of secular Gothic architecture. So the cathedrals and things like that we know are, are the main examples we think of, but here's a, a civic building that is Gothic. Early uh, in the morning? Yeah. yeah. Early uh, in the morning. And so, um, anyway, so all of Venice is, is, um, is beautiful like that, right? And same thing, all the art and, and music and everything that is coming out of it. It's a major center ultimately for, for publishing. So, and as the centuries wear on, um, uh, uh, you know, you get to hear oh, closing now into the modern era, um, Venice, you know, goes from just owning the clinging to the coast to owning more and more. And the, you know, some of the city states are, are bigger like Milan uh, and Florence that are able to emerge as kind of uh, rivals and competitors, you know, as things go on. But ultimately everybody, you know, is having to deal with Austria, Hungary, France, <laughs> Uh, Southern Italy, which is owned by, by Spain, you know, and so in other words, there's too many great powers running around for anybody to, to be uh, too strong against it, although the Venetians are the ones that are the strongest of, of any of them in part because of, um, and in part because of their system, but just also because everything that they control. Okay, so we're not quite done <laughs> getting this guy, our guy Doge. So after they've already, everybody's elected him, the Grand Council's had their say with him, that's when now they would send him out uh, and show him to then this Arenio, you know, in other words, all of the people. So now we're going to have that per per particular part of the, the history or the heritage form where everybody acclaims the doge. And so when he's presented, he was traditionally presented by, the, with the phrase, you know, the Grand Council gives says, this is your doge if it please you. And so that's giving them kind of the option, you know, to acclaim or not to acclaim. <clears throat> but as we've talked about uh, Venice becoming increasingly uh, closed, the aristocracy is not letting new aristocratic families in, and the oligarchy is just turning the screws on, on the control of it. So as the uh, uh, economy and other things are drying up and the, uh, the thing is calcifying a lot more, um, even this form goes away and they start saying after 1423, your doge, <laughs> you know, so not if it please you, right? <coughs> okay, um, so how were they able then, how were the oligarchs able to continually check the power of the doges? And so to be then crowned doge uh, early on, um, one of the things that you have to do is swear an oath of office. Uh, and this is still done with presidents and, and prime ministers, and this is also, 
uh, was frequently done, uh, for example, when the British monarchs were crowned. And so one of the reasons why, as we saw, the British monarchy evolved into a constitutional monarchy was uh, they started having to issue, reissue Magna Carta uh, each time. So they get crowned and they issue Magna Carta and then they have to issue a bunch of other stuff on top of that until at a certain point they no longer are in charge of anything and they only have a, a, a ceremonial role. Uh, likewise, then, the doges have promises that they make, uh, and then the promises get longer and longer until at a certain point they're making 168-page promises or something like that uh, in order to have limits on their constitutional powers. So they initially start with things like that they're going to govern fairly, they'll judge impartially, uh, they're not going to tell anybody all the state secrets. That should be part of the oath of presidents. <laughs> Don't tell the Russians. Anyway, no, anyway, so execute the will of the Grand Council. Uh, in other words, they're going to listen to the legislature, the judiciary, they're not going to just rule as a tyrant. Um, the very earliest permissione that we have is actually the same uh, doge, Enrico Dandolo. Uh, and so one of his um, uh, promises that he makes is that he will not have any private correspondence uh, with any foreign prince. And so if he actually receives a letter um, you know, from a prince in the Ukraine, for example, <laughs> um, he would have to have other members of those six other guys, you know, in the small council open it up, right? Yeah, and this is kind of where, what? Well, they, we, they did have people listening in, right? But anyway, so, so this is the same thing though. So you're also not allowed to, for example, um, own property in that country, like buying a hotel there or a golf course. <laughs> Uh, because the idea of it is that if he did have those things, then he could be pressured, you know, to put his own personal interests as do above the, his interest in the office as, as Doge and the interest of the Republic, right? And so that's already into, worked into the constitutional system in the 12th century in Venice. Okay, um, so even so, it is going in this kind of opposite direction of what other uh, monarchies are doing, for example, in the Middle Ages and early modern times. So the French monarchy, as we saw, is becoming more and more hereditary and it actually becomes more and more absolutist. So that um, by the time you get to someone like Louis XIV uh, and the later French kings, they actually have so much more authority than their medieval um, predecessors had. Uh, the opposite trend is happening uh, in Do the Doge uh, things. And so the monarchy becomes more and more constitutional uh, through that same time period. So. Um, to just kind of uh, give the rest of the story of Venice, because we can't do everything in the kind of detail that we've already done. Um, at a certain point, uh, the, um, like I say, the East Roman Empire never really fully recovers, and ultimately um, there's a little bit of a contest whether a resurgent Bulgarian Empire or whether the uh, Turkish Sultanates are going to be able to win and conquer it, but at a certain point it's definitely the Turks, uh, and in 1453 that falls. Um, meanwhile, the Venetians have, have continued to maintain this entire, uh, all these colonies and everything like that, that they inherited from, you know, or stole from the Byzantines uh, and have in helped with, you know, with the Crusaders helped with and that kind of thing. There's Zara still. Um, uh, and, they, and they've may worked their way more inland as they are less and less, I mean, they're still he heavily involved in trading, but at a certain point the trading becomes less important and they're more becoming, let's say, landed overlords and, and all of them are, let's say, lords of landed estates that they have on the mainland and things like that. So um, as we mentioned then, as that's happening, uh, one of the ways that the doges are kept from seizing power is they, are ha they themselves are under continual surveillance. So at a certain point, those people in the small council are more or less always with them. So you can't, they're not getting the correspondence. At a certain point, their families are also being, being watched. Um, most of those actions that the doge can ever take has to be in concert with the council. Um, and then those guys themselves are also having to operate in concert with, uh, as we mentioned, that full college, which is all those other 15 leaders, uh, or when they needed to turn something around really fast with that uh, council of 10 that uh, becomes so kind of infamous, right? And so those are these kind of two sections of the executive. So the doge is still there and is still acting, but is also you know, acting only in the concert with the full college or with the council of 10 and the council minor. So um, the ground council it's, itself becomes less and less important as there's more and more members of it. And I mentioned then this, to so just talk a little bit about this council of 10. 
born as a temporary measure because there was a plot against the Republic uh, in 1310. Uh, it nevertheless got renewed continuously until a century. It was just declared, okay, it's permanent, <laughs> you know, and it lasted until the end. Uh, and it had powers, for example, of um, reviewing, for example, all of the intelligence that is being gathered, including domestic surveillance, uh, international intelligence, uh, and conducting, it could also conduct trials, and it could also um, mete out punishments up to and including uh, banishment or even execution of nobles. So it was... Um, fairly powerful and able to act quickly as opposed to the bigger councils. Um, the Venetians ended up being very uh, early innovators in espionage. So they um, created some of these, again, domestic, uh, you know, the, the, it's very clear that the, um, if you watched Game of Thrones, they have what's called the small council as opposed to the minor council here. <laughs> And the small council included um, the eunuch that had all the little spies, you know, and they were having spies that were in the other foreign realm where they were going to try to assassinate um, the, the foreign, you know, the rival um, queen. And they also have the domestic spies, they're spying everywhere. So in the same kind of a way, this is what inspired that story. And indeed, the Venetians are um, the people who pioneered the idea of sending permanent embassies and creating extraterritorial um, uh, in, in embassies and, and that kind of a thing, always having a, a permanent envoy uh, at a, a rival court. And they then also pioneered spying, <laughs> using the embassy as a spy. I mean, as you know from like James Bond and everything, that's where all the spies all are, and at a certain point that, that's still all, all happening. Um, but one of the great things for historians is, because the Venetian spies were doing such a good job of writing that all down and sending it back to the Council of Ten, is that we have a lot of interesting um, uh, information about what's going on, for example, at like Henry VIII's court, because the Venetians are writing stuff down and, and we have kind of like their kind of notes of what they were saying anyway, or at least their understanding of the politics. Um, anyway, so they're doing those kind of things. So the, ultimately the, the end for the Venetians, um, on the one hand, the, the state becomes much more brittle as it's less and less able to act or doing any, do anything. Um, it's becoming more exclusive. They're not able to bring any new people into the uh, nobility. The nobility itself is becoming less commercial and more about just owning land and stuff like that. So again, less dynamic. But um, when the big thing happens uh, that the Portuguese are able to get around Africa and get to the spices, uh, then suddenly, and then the Spanish likewise get here and find all the gold that they never want. Uh, and then they're able to get sugar and everything else like this. So when that kind of thing all starts happening, all of the trade that had been freely flowing against the Mongol Empire, which breaks apart, and now suddenly uh, the Turks are here, the, this trade is still coming through. Uh, but anyway, it's not anywhere near what you can do by getting a big ocean-going ship and going all the way around. And so they're commercially outmatched. And even in their own, um, in their own place, in the Adriatic, the Austrians who um, end up being the heirs to the Holy Roman Empire, they build a port just across from Venice at Trieste, and so they can bring the, their own, uh, they can't ship it. The Venetians aren't trading to the Germans anymore, and likewise they aren't trading to the Italian areas because the Pope also have their own port at this point in Ancona. And so, so it becomes commercially, it's no longer the commercial center that it had been for the preceding um, thousand years. Uh, and so all of that shifts and Venice is now increasingly, by the end, um, just a place that is living on its old wealth and laurels uh, and not a place that's actively, um, you know, the center of trade and every, anymore. And so um, as with so many things that, let's say, were archaic holdovers, by the time um, the French Revolution happens, which up upends all of the ancient regimes, and Napoleon and all of his troops pour out over Europe, there's a fairly early campaign into Italy, and everything just collapses for the Venetians, and they ultimately, uh, when they get the last time they bring the Grand Council together, most everybody's run away, so they don't even have a quorum. <laughs> um, but the Doge, nevertheless, you know, they all vote to just surrender. Uh, and so, uh, and the, the public ends, you know, with a with quite a whimper as Napoleon. Uh, well, he, Napoleon makes a big declaration. Uh, the, the 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 public had 
had been able to hold out against Attila the Hun, you know, those the refugees had gotten away, and Napoleon says, you know, there's not going to be any more Senate, there's not going to be any more of this, you know, these inquisitors that are doing all of these, um, these secrets according to essentially the, and torture and things like that, that is the kind of the reputation that the Venetians have. I will be an Attila to the Venetians. <laughs> and so he um, brings it to an end. You can kind of see all of the Republic and flags there on the boats that are taking Venice. Mike. And then the other, from the other side of that equation, the, there's the famous quote that the last doge after that vote gives, takes his cap off and gives it to his secretary and says, here, take this. I shan't be needing it anymore. Oh. And that's the end of the republic. That's the end. That happens. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So <laughs> after the Venetians are left with Venice, <laughs> most of the artifacts, the French take a lot of stuff. And whenever you conquer somebody, you grab a bunch of things and they bring it all back to the Louvre. But anyway, and then the Nazis grabbed a lot of that. But anyway, you know, this kind of a thing that happens. But anyway, uh, you, then it, the Venice is left with this amazing artifacts uh, and just this built structure that is incomparable to anything else. There's nothing else in the world that's like it. Um, and so they also are heir to the tourists <laughs> as, the sh as the boats and the big cruise lines just pour people out onto the, <laughs> you know, onto the St. Mark Square. Uh, and indeed, it was the original tourists. So as we mentioned, when, when people first started doing tourism, um, the British um, wealthy nobles and upper middle class people would go to Italy and do their holidays. And Venice is one of the first places they would go, Florence and Venice. Elizabeth. <laughs> Yeah, if you were a bit about the economy, Jane Jacobs, and I'm quoting from memory at this point, but she writes about how Venice got its start. They had one substance, one resource to trade, and that was salt. Right. And they sold it mostly out east, Constantinople. Uh, but then, and, and with what they made, they bought stuff from Constantinople. Right. Then they started copying what they had bought. And they sold their copies in Europe to other cities and other places. And their copies probably weren't as good as the originals, but they were a hell of a lot better than what their customers had, which was nothing. And so on it went. And they invented something like a joint stock corporation called a commenda. It was set up for like one voyage. And you'd have a rich guy who provided the money and a guy with the guts and the ship, and he traveled with the ship. Uh, and then they would split the profits, assuming the ship made it there and made it back. Yes. And this allowed young men, this all men of course, uh, of no particular family to get rich. Right. And to join the merchant aristocracy. Right. And then they shut it down. In 1286, they had the serrata, the closure. Right. Uh, no more newcomers into, this, in, into the aristocracy. Right. And they outlawed the commenda. Mm. And uh, today, fishing, a little bit of fishing, and lots of tourism. Right. They mm. screwed themselves. <laughs> yeah. So we could have even done, um, I mostly, I mean, it's, there's only so much you can do in a lecture. We, we, we mostly was trying to do a, a little bit of the, uh, the kind of political context, but then also <laughs> do kind of a constitutional and how uh, history and contrasting it to the, through the time period. But we could just as easily have done um, an artistic history, a cultural history, and especially a commercial one. Because uh, what the, even if the Venetians didn't stick with it, uh, what the Venetians and also the Genoese also, um, I think the, the Genoese are the ones that invented, um, what's it called, accounting, the, the, the double, double entry double accounting. Double. <laughs> so like they, so the Venetians, I mean the Genoese invented like that and then they um, also invented different types of, like you say, companies, you know, uh, joint stock companies and also uh, uh, being in also different kinds of investment and ultimately banking. And so as a result of that, um, there's in so many ways uh, uh, as we, um, in the West are largely um, descended of essentially the bourgeois uh, Z uh, taking everything over. These early merchants who are creating all of those things are in so many ways more our forebearers than 
let's say the king of England, <laughs> you know, uh, that, um, you know, that, that's also an important thing that could be for a future lecture, that, that kind of commercial uh, and economic revolution that is also taking place in Europe. So. Uh, but we did what we did. We did what we did. <laughs> and so that's the Republic of Venice <laughs> history of tonight.